London's burning starts next weekend. This happens to be a fire station, not a playground. Must be quite exciting being a fireman. Has its moments. We're going across England! Yeah, well, we're pretty close mates here. I nearly rang you the other night. That was you, was it? You gonna tell us about your love life? You can be a real peak. Do you know that? Starting next weekend on LWT, London's Burning. And next on LWT, the world news from ITN with Trevor MacDonald. Sometimes even the world's finest cooks need to thicken things in a bit of a hurry. But with new McDougall's thickening granules, you don't have to make heavy weather of it. No need for pre-mixing, no need for extra cooking. In fact, you'll find McDougall's thickening granules will thicken just about anything hot. Kitty can't do the same for the Atlantic. In the 50s, when young people left Britain to seek a new life in a new world, their families thought that they would probably never see or even speak to them again. To telephone in those days took a lot of patience and money. But that was before British Telecom International Direct Dialing. Today, the Atlantic is spanned by cables and satellites that carry thousands of conversations at a time. Each dialed direct in seconds. Amazingly, the cost of a call has actually gone down. Now you can dial a relative an ocean away in Canada, say, and talk for three minutes for just £1.77. Hello, Pat! No other country has done more to keep its families together. But then, no other country has IDD from British Telecom. Gets you going. Sunday, 2.30, Middlesbrough, the club that came back from the brink of financial ruin, take on Aston Villa at Ayrson Park. The home side have set their sights on Division 1, so there's all to play for. See it live and exclusive Sunday, 2.30. Tonight at 9.55 in Aspel and Company, Anita Dobson tells for the first time why Angie is leaving EastEnders. Plus the incredible Chuck Berry, the father figure of rock and roll. And it's hello, good evening and welcome from David Frost. Michael Aspel keeps some very exclusive company tonight at 9.55. You're watching LWT. The news from ITM. The world's biggest heroin haul, two billion pounds worth seized in Bangkok. A Soviet first, cameras allowed into an SS-20 missile base. Mrs. Thatcher accused of caving in to the European farm lobby. And shock in the first division, Liverpool give away a goal. 
Good evening. Customs officials in Thailand have seized a ton and a half of high-grade heroin, the world's biggest haul of the drug. It was uncovered at the docks in Bangkok on a ship bound for New York. Tonight, American drug officers put its street value at around two billion pounds. They were relieved and delighted with the find. Simon Cole at ITN reports. Bangkok has seen huge heroin hauls before, but nothing like this. Small boys help customs unload it, one and a half tons packed among a ship's cargo of rubber sheets, which prevented police dogs sniffing it out. A tip-off had sent customs to the docks in Thailand's capital, and the heroin was found on a freighter bound for New York. It's likely American drug enforcement officers played a major role in the discovery. They've been concerned for some time about the so-called Golden Triangle, a drug-producing region on the borders of Thailand, Laos and Burma. It's here where fields of poppies are harvested to produce opium and further refined to make heroin. Some is destroyed by the Thai authorities, but much more is funneled down to Bangkok. A major homegrown drug problem is a byproduct of a lucrative export market. The potential market this time, as so often before, was America. And if it had left Thailand, would have killed, in the customs man's words, an uncountable number of people. That's why the American Drug Enforcement Agency is delighted tonight, despite the lack of arrests. Police in Bangkok and New York are trying to track down the smugglers who would have made a fortune from the highly refined heroin. The Soviet Union gave the world an unprecedented look tonight at the inside of a top-secret military base for SS-20 nuclear missiles. Those are the medium-range weapons due to be abolished after the Washington summit, along with their crews and Pershing equivalents in the West. Soviet television took Eastern Bloc journalists to the base. Its location was not given. There's no snow and the soldiers wear no greatcoats. The missile base the Soviets showed on television tonight was far to the south of Moscow. These are extraordinary pictures, revealing an SS-20 missile and launcher in the field. Such sites were once top secret. The Russian reporter says he's at an unknown point. It's the first time these weapons have been shown in situ rather than in the open. Tonight, Soviet viewers heard this is a typical exercise. The soldiers are always on full alert, never knowing if the order to scramble is the real thing. And the report claims this was the first time the soldiers had ever seen the launcher in daylight. Night exercises were the norm. The point was to mark two months since the INF deal was signed at the Washington summit. It will scrap this entire class of missiles. On hand to see evidence of the new political thinking that's made this possible, foreign correspondents and their cameras. But there are limits to Glasnost. The cameras are only from the socialist countries of Eastern Europe, that stand in the front line of arms control deals with the West. Ian Glover James, ITN, Moscow. The Russians today blame the Americans for the Black Sea collision between two US warships and two Soviet ones. Mr. Gennady Gerasimov of the Soviet Foreign Ministry said the Americans maneuvered dangerously. Washington says the Russians rammed them. Here, the Health Secretary, Mr. John Moore, has said he wants to keep people free from having to worry about medical bills, even if there are changes in NHS funding. But he told the Young Conservatives Conference in Eastbourne he was keeping all options open. Nurses in uniform were out lobbying Young Conservatives, and in particular, Secretary of State John Moore their plea to save the National Health Service. But inside, Mr. Moore implied strongly the 40 years of free provision for all were near an end. I will not be afraid, the government will not, to consider all options in this area. We mustn't be trapped in dogma, nor must we be trapped in the past. Our aim must be absolutely clear. I want to keep that vision, the vision of a health service for all, free from fear of money needed at the time of health need. That pleased the young radical right, but the biggest welcome was for the education secretary's appeal to family values. Parents must accept that they are the first educators, and without fulfilling that responsibility, the formal education system is just going to be another state agency for coping with social casualties. 
the young Tories united in their ovation, but tonight the open battle among themselves for control of the youth movement broke out. Supporters of the current moderate leadership picketed right-wingers and alleged far-right freedom groups had put up the money for an unprecedented election meeting. It was a free bash in support of the right-wing candidates bidding tomorrow to take control of the organisation. But that's a prospect viewed with much concern by Conservative Party officials. Kevin Dunn, ITN, Eastbourne. Leaders of Britain's biggest nurses' union, the Royal College of Nursing, have confirmed they'll hold an immediate ballot to decide whether to retain their no-strike policy. A two-thirds majority is needed to change the rules, the results expected in about a month. The ferrymen whose dispute sparked the national seamen strike could return to work tomorrow. The Isle of Man Steam Packet Company and the National Union of Seamen signed a provisional agreement tonight. It means the number of planned redundancies will be reduced from 80 to 47. Union leaders will recommend the deal to members at mass meetings tomorrow. Labour and some Conservative critics of the new common market budget reform say Mrs Thatcher has given in to the European farming lobby. The Shadow Foreign Secretary, Mr Gerald Kaufman, says the Prime Minister left Brussels with bent knee. Mrs Thatcher did make concessions on overproduction, but she says she achieved the main objectives. It took 14 hours of often furious argument, and when the deal came at 1am, it represented tighter spending controls than ever before, but not as tight as Mrs Thatcher in the top floor summit suite had been holding out for. She herself was not overjoyed, warned the assembled press not to be over cheerful either. She was particularly angry with the French for insisting that the deal can only stand if foreign ministers now meet to re-examine controls on a whole range of lesser products. I can't tell you. Only a Frenchman could have done that. It's absolute unbelievable. Mrs Thatcher thought it absurd that the French should hold up this deal on massive crops like cereals with what she saw as quibbles about controls or stabilisers on unimportant things like tobacco and sugar. It's absolutely crazy that we're fit in this council to discuss three main stabilisers but totally unfit to decide seven to eight minor ones. It's a Gilbertian situation but there you are. I never did understand men. No. Once tempers have cooled, the result of the deal will be to cut the share of the EEC budget going to Europe's 10 million farmers from 68% last year to 62% this year. And finally in 1992, when this new plan runs out, down to 56%. As the farmers' cash goes down, the plan is to boost resources to poorer areas from just 14% of the budget last year to 17.5% this year. And then by 1992, up to over 24.5%. That's £9,000 million for subsidies to industry, inner cities, roads and telecommunications. So complicated are these new farm regulations that it was left to the Foreign Secretary to sum it up thus. It is the detail that makes it difficult for you to explain that makes it effective. <laughs> Getting any sort of agreement at all has clearly taken its toll in the British camp it was not until 3 a.m. that Mrs. Thatcher had finally divested herself both of the detail and of her less charitable thoughts on the French and set course for Downing Street. John Snow, ITN, Brussels. Here, 1,500 volunteers have joined a huge search for the missing computer operator Helen McCourt. Merseyside police say they believe she's already dead. Hundreds of volunteers, including the missing girl's brother, swamped the village of Billinge near Wigan in today's search for Helen's body. Groups of searchers, each led by a police officer, were briefed about her appearance. She's described as being five foot tall, medium build, fresh complexion, blue-green eyes, dark hair. The search concentrated on streams, copses and woodlands for miles around the village, an area which has already been searched from the air without producing any clues. Helen was last seen getting off this bus around 5.15 on Tuesday evening. Police believe she may have accepted a lift from someone she knew because of the bad weather. As frogmen searched for Helen's body, police said they're still interviewing a 31-year-old man in connection with her disappearance. No charges will be brought today. Mark Webster, ITN, Lancashire. And now, with all the news of today's sporting action, here's our sports correspondent, Giles Smith. Liverpool's drive to the championship goes on remorselessly. Their latest victims today, Watford. Their recent revival and awful conditions at Vicarage Road didn't daunt the champions-elect as they won 4-1. If no one can beat Liverpool, what price the next team to score first against them? 
Watford came close today. Ablett and Hanson tied up in the mud. Trevor Senior's chip almost good enough. Then from the corner, another out of character scramble in the box. McClellan finally slicing wide. All that was in the first 10 minutes. Then Liverpool stopped playing around and Watford began sinking. Beardsley's first came out of nowhere. A routine run round the box with a marker who wasn't close enough. 1-0 at half-time and Watford's full house was expecting a miracle. But five minutes into the second half, it was all over. Houghton's cross exposing more slack marking with Aldridge closing in. Then the goal of the game from Beardsley again. It was another simple solo effort which only a great player can create. But the fourth really was simple. A Barnes tap-in as Watford's defence again failed to mark the right man. Then tragedy for the Anfield outfit, a 10-match spell without even conceding a goal, ruined by a moment's hesitation. Blissett got the consolation, but Grobelau won't get the sack. Peter Staunton, ITN Sport, Vicarage Road. Steve Bruce's first goal for United helped them stay in second place. Chelsea's dismal run goes on, they haven't won now for 14 games. Nigel Clough got the equaliser for Forrest, but for Clough Senior it seems like goodbye to the title as well as that job for Wales. An own goal from Paul Parker eased Everton's return to league action after their cup tie marathons. Paul Poynton got the other. And in Scotland, Frank McAvenny's late goal keeps Celtic three points ahead of Rangers, who beat St Mirren 4-0. Cricket and fine bowling by Graham Dilley has put England into a strong position on the second day of the first test at Christchurch. England were all out for 319. New Zealand, without the injured Richard Hadley, are 83 for four. Dilley took all four wickets. Medical advice meant Hadley's place in cricket history was again delayed, frustrating for supporters and the player himself, still nursing a strained calf muscle. In poor light and Hadley's absence, England's batsmen volunteered to start, but quickly wished they hadn't. Ewan Chatfield struck with his first ball, Capel out for 11, and after Rathi fell to another great catch from Great Batch, Chatfield picked up another three wickets as England's last six batsmen fell for just 84 runs. If it brought a smile back to Hadley's face, it was only temporary. Graham Dilley strode in to produce his finest burst of test match bowling. John Wright was the first victim, and Trevor Franklin soon followed. Andrew Jones is New Zealand's new star. Dilley saw him off too. And then the big wicket, Martin Crowe went for only five. New Zealand were 40 for four and in big trouble. John Bracewell and Jeff Crow are trying to redeem matters, but in Christchurch, it's the Poms doing the pounding. Mark Austin, ITN Sport, Christchurch. In Rugby Union, it was the fourth round of the John Player Cup. The holders Bath beat Leicester 13-6, last year's finalists Wasps beat Gloucester 24-13, while Bristol overwhelmed Richmond 34-0. The best of Bristol's six tries came late in the second half from a line-out. Hogg and Nibs set up Hugh Duggan for a scissors back round his forwards. He handed on to Carr, and when he was stopped a few yards short of the Bristol forwards, were quickly on hand to set up the try for Harding. Racing and the instant on the right could prove expensive for champion jockey Peter Scudamore. It happened at Newbury yesterday. Jockey Bruce Dowling tried to pass Scudamore on the inside, but the champion wasn't having it, and the pair became caught up in a private feud. Then at the next jump, Dowling's mount fell. Both face a hearing at the jockey club. A long suspension could mean the champion missing that Cheltenham festival next month. And just for the record, the rugby minnows from Berry Hill went out to Harlequins by 17 points to four in their John Player Cup tie. But given the conditions, I wonder if anyone could tell. And just as we thought of making a clean getaway. That's it tonight from the ITN Weekend News team. Good night. A real threat now faces the country's nuclear power program. It's called electricity privatisation. Watch Weekend World, live tomorrow at noon on ITV.
Good evening, a look at the weather now. Well, after all the rain we've been having lately, it looks as if we're going to have a few days of much drier weather at last. Tomorrow is certainly going to be better than today. But for the rest of tonight, there will be some more rain. Some of it will be quite heavy. Temperatures are extremely mild, though, more like what we'd expect at the end of April. 7 Celsius is 45 Fahrenheit. Winds are from the south-southwest and falling to just a light 10 miles per hour. Well, Kent and Sussex are going to get the best weather out of the LWT region tomorrow. It'll be a mainly dry day with just one or two spots of rain first thing. But the main area of rain is moving north, and although it'll leave a lot of cloud behind, there won't be as much as today. And it should thin out a little in the afternoon, especially in those southeastern areas. Temperatures will reach 10 Celsius, 50 Fahrenheit, and the winds from the south will only blow at 15 miles per hour. Well, that's all from us for tonight, but we'll be back at one o'clock with the news tomorrow. Good night.